Once a fault has developed in the continental crust, you might expect this floor to focus deformation, even if this happens long after it first formed and the crust finds itself in a different tectonic regime. If normal faults formed during rifting reactivate later under contraction, it's called inversion tectonics. So tectonic inversion involves fault reactivation in the opposite sense to which that fault originally occurred. It involves contraction of extensional or rift basins. We can look at these, we'll use the regional concept, we'll look at null points, and then we'll see how the dip of faults may control how reactivation progresses. So let's look at an example. Here's a cross section through part of the North Malay Basin. At the bottom of the section we've got basement rocks overlain by a sedimentary cover which was deposited from the Eocene and Ligocene up to the present day. And these units are cut by faults. What type of faults are these? Well, to answer that question, let's apply the regional concept. For an individual horizon, its regional is where it would be had the local structures not developed. It's regional orientation and elevation. So here's the regional for the top basement marker. So at the level of the basement, what's happened? Well, the top of the basement has gone down relative to its regional. Let's draw in the regional for the top of the middle Miocene package, which are those orange rocks on the profile. And we can see in two places along this profile, the top of the middle Miocene is above its regional. So in other words, at the level of the basement, we're in net extension, and at the top of the middle Miocene, in two places, we're in net contraction. So the fault that underlies those two places we infer has reactivated as a thrust. Let's zoom in on one of those and we can emphasize the point. So the top basement horizon is below its regional, the top of the middle Miocene is above its regional. So these are reactivated former normal faults, but notice that not all these faults have reactivated. The structures on the left of the profile are still in net extension. So let's see how this might work in a simple cartoon. So here's a rotational normal fault, down thrown to the right, with the stratigraphic sections in the hanging wall expanding towards the fault. Let's reactivate this gradually as a thrust, so the hanging wall now will move up. Here we go. And a bit more. And a bit more. So let's hold it a minute and have a look. So there's a place on this fault where the rocks in the hanging wall match back to those in the foot wall. This is called a null point. There's no finite offset. Of course, as we've seen, it doesn't mean that there hasn't been fault slip through that point, merely that the contractional slip has recovered the offset that had been developed during the normal faulting. Above the null point, the position of markers in the hanging wall is above their position in the foot wall. Below the null point, the opposite is true. The markers in the hanging wall are below their position in the foot wall. So let's continue reactivating this fault in contraction. Watch what happens to the null point as the hanging wall moves up. It moves down the fault until eventually it disappears entirely as the entire fault is now in net contraction. So identifying a null point is a really useful thing to do and it provides a framework for understanding the net offset of markers between the hanging wall and the foot wall. Let's apply this idea to here on a seismic section from the Adriatic Let's add some interpretation. And we can look at the larger fault in the middle of this diagram. Let's strip away the seismic. So here are the stratigraphic markers and faults. And if we pick that light blue horizon, horizon A, and follow it across the diagram, we can see as it crosses that main fault in the middle, 
there's no offset. So that is a null point. The markers above the null point are in net contraction. The markers below the null point, essentially the top basement marker, is in net extension. So there's a well-ordered arrangement of offsets along this reactivated fault. So we can interpret our seismic to suggest that there was once an array of normal faults, one of which has reactivated in contraction. But the contractional offset has not been sufficient to recover all the displacement that was achieved during the normal faulting episodes. We could evaluate the timing of the contractional reactivation by looking at the seismic stratigraphy of the Playa Quaternary strata that were deposited as this fold grew. Let's strip away the seismic again and look at the regionals. So the top regional is for the top Mycenaean marker, the green marker, and the lower one is for the top basement. And we can see that the top basement horizon is below its own regional, so it's in net extension, whereas the top Mycenaean marker is above its regional, so is in net contraction. So we're dealing with a normal fault reactivated in contraction. So let's leave the Adriatic and head to southern England. Here's a classic example of an inversion structure in the Wessex Basin. On the southern part of this section we have a large anticline, the Lulworth Banks anticline, which is picked out by a broad arch of Cretaceous chalk in green at the top of the stratigraphy here. It's clearly uplifted in the Hanuwal to the Purbeck fault zone. But look at some of the other markers below the chalk. The Mercia mudstone, for example, that we can see deep in the core of the Lulworth Banks anticline, is downthrown still compared to its position on the left-hand side, the footwall of the Purbeck fault zone. So the perfect fault zone is an inversion structure. Notice that new fault segments have broken through the chalk, so those parts of the fault zone are entirely new thrust segments. Only the part of the fault zone that lies below the chalk was once a normal fault. Notice also that the other faults on the footwall to the perfect fault zone, off to the north, terminate upwards against the base of the chalk. That's an unconformity. The unconformity is not offset, so those faults have not reactivated since the chalk has been deposited. Indeed, they're still all in net extensional throw. So some faults reactivate, some don't. Why might this be? So this issue is explored by Rick Sibson using this setup. So let's imagine a normal fault or a set of normal faults with different dips and here these different dips all pull together onto a single fault surface. In order to reactivate this structure under contraction the maximum compressive stress will be horizontal, the minimum compressive stress will be vertical and we can consider the angle of incidence between sigma 1, the maximum compressive stress, and different parts of the fault surface. So this angle of incidence is theta. Let's look at how this might behave. So here we're plotting theta, the angle of incidence between sigma 1, the maximum compressive stress, and the fault zone. And we're plotting this against the coefficient of friction of the fault. In other words, how slippy that fault surface is. Low coefficients of friction means that's a really slippy fault surface. And high coefficients of friction means it's a sticky one. And we can put a range of behaviours onto this graph. A relationship where the fault can no longer slip, it's too steep, and optimal behaviour where fault reactivation is easiest. Now let's put on a typical range of friction coefficient. Here we are, it's so-called Biolee friction. This has a range, typically, of between about 0.6 and a shade over 0.8. If we assume our fault zone has this frictional behaviour, what does this predict about the dips of faults that can reactivate? For the higher friction coefficient value of a shade over 0.8, this implies a maximum dip for reactivation of around 50 degrees. If we reduce the friction coefficient to 0.6, 
we can increase the dip of the fault that can reactivate, but it still doesn't achieve a dip of greater than about 58 degrees. So this range of between 58 down to 50 degrees is the maximum dip for fault reactivation, assuming the faults behave with bioly friction. So let's see how this works if we go and look at a cross section. So here's a cross section through offshore Kalimantan based on seismic data. In carrying out this investigation, of course, we have to be really sure that the cross section has no vertical exaggeration, so the dips we see on the cross section are appropriate. Well, let's look at this cross section, and we can see that some faults reactivate and some don't. So here are the ones that reactivate, and others are not reactivating. So these are the faults that don't reactivate. Why? Is this because they were too steep or too sticky? with high friction coefficients at the time the reactivation occurred. Well, actually quite a lot of these look lower angled than the ones have reactivated, but this is a two-dimensional view. The angle of incidence is something that applies in three dimensions. So let's make a three-dimensional diagram of a fault. We can't assume that the fault reactivates by ideal dip slip if it does, then the fault slip is effectively seeing the entire dip of the fault. If the kinematics are for oblique slip, then the effective angle of incidence is reduced. So we have to be careful to carry out this type of analysis in 3D, not simply on cross sections. But nevertheless, what might happen if the fault is too steep to be reactivated given a particular kinematic condition? Well, it means that the wall rocks are loaded, so they may fail. And rather than reactivate the steep segment of the pre-existing fault, an entirely new fault segment may break off into the foot wall of the original fault to create an overall lower angle fault surface. These types of behaviour are remarkably common. Here's another section from offshore East Java, again based on seismic data, pink basement and then various sideranchy cover rocks on top in the green the tans all the way up to the blue. Let's look across this section and identify which faults reactivate and which don't. So we can see we've got a few reactivated inverted normal faults, we've got an array of normal faults that have not reactivated and we've got a few fault segments that appear to be entirely new thrust or reverse faults. Let's zoom in on one of these. Here we go. And we can identify that that small little basin there, which contains the thick section of early Sinrif dark green, well, the normal fault at the level of the sedimentary cover has not reactivated. It's still in extension all the way through to its tip. And consequently is shown with a white arrow on here. In contrast, we can infer the deeper structure of these normal faults has indeed reactivated. The one on the right has uplifted the top of the green above its regional and is now in next contraction. But the fault on the left has reactivated and then trimmed off the corner to make a feature called a footwall shortcut, isolating a pip of basement that has been carried up towards the sedimentary cover. So some faults reactivate, some don't, and some entirely new fault segments can grow. So that's a brief look at inversion tectonics. Fault reactivation in the opposite sense to which those faults originally formed. Contraction of extensional or rift basin faults. We've looked at the use of the regional concept and identified null points and we've discussed a little about the impact of fault dip about how structures reactivate.